Well, praise the Lord. Let's uh, pray and then we'll get right into the Word. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and to receive from your Word. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit who is the teacher just coming in and taking, in, taking this service over and instructing us from the Word of God. We just thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, what I want to do tonight is, is a little unusual. Uh, it's kind of, a, kind of a study within a study, in a way. Uh, but it's, it's a good Bible lesson in Bible interpretation, which is as much the point as what we're going to be reading from the Scripture. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, we see, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, so there were obviously some letters being passed around that he didn't write. As that the day of Christ is at hand, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, what I want to do right here is just stop a minute and talk about kind of where, where this comes in, where this teaching uh, comes from, and that is last days, end of days, teaching, and teaching on the rapture. Now, when I was much younger, <laughs> back in 1973, as a matter of fact, uh, I was a junior at high school, and believe it or not, my Southern Baptist Church uh, let me teach the Word to the adult class. Now, I was 17. <laughs> I don't know whether it was wise on their part or on my part <laughs> for me to be teaching at that age. Uh, I've always been a little kind of mature for my age, but I don't know, 17-year-old kid teaching the Word, eh, it might be stretching it a bit. But what my favorite topic was back then was the Second Coming, was end of days teaching, or eschatology is the official, you know, theological word for it, the study of the end days. And uh, I was an expert <laughs> in my own mind on it. And uh, I actually have teaching tapes from those days that will never see the light of day <laughs> because most of what I said was incorrect back then. And so I, didn't, I don't want them out there <laughs> with my name on it. Uh, so that was kind of where I was coming from. I was fascinated by the last day's teaching. And, uh, you know, we had the Left Behind books come out during a certain period of time. We had uh, Tim LaHaye writing about uh, the last days, I had all of his books, and I had all kinds of books and studies. And all of it was interesting. A lot of different opinions as to what certain things meant in the Scriptures. And in studying it out, you could go any number of different directions. There were people that believed that the rapture would come before the tribulation. There were people that believed it came in the middle of the tribulation. There were people that believed that Christians were going to go through the tribulation, the rapture wasn't until the end of the tribulation. And there were those who taught there was no rapture at all. <laughs> so they were coming from every which direction. And I dutifully read every single book with every single opinion. So I was as confused as anybody <laughs> on second coming teaching. And the problem is, there are a lot of people that study these kinds of scriptures, and they try to apply their own thought process to it instead of getting into a really deep study of the scripture and of the original language and what it's talking about and just plain old being led by the Holy Ghost. And that's why they get off base. Well, this is one of those areas. If you, I've got an interlinear King James and Amplified here. If I go over to the Amplified, and I read part of the same scripture we just read, where it says, verse 3, Let no man deceive you uh, by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Now this Greek word, that's translated falling away is the Greek word apostasia. Apostasia. And it is commonly restated in English. It's not even a translation. It's more of a word that came from this word. Commonly called the apostasy. The apostasy refers to a time when a lot of Christians who have been very sincere Christians will fall away from the faith. Okay? 
pastor has quoted it recently, talking about different things, talked about the falling away from the faith. Well, that is true, and that's absolutely what will happen and what is happening. I believe we're in the last days. And so a lot of what we're seeing are people who are falling away from the faith. There are people claiming to be Christians who are saying that homosexuality is not a sin, that it's just a lifestyle, we should accept it. And there are people that are even saying that we need to revise the Bible because it hasn't kept up with the times, and so we have to revise it and, and keep it up with, with modern uh, thinking. Well, God doesn't change his mind. <laughs> I, you know, I'm sorry to tell him, uh, that's just not the way it is. The Word of God is settled forever in heaven. It is not something that you can change, not something you should ever want to change. But at any rate, there are people that are falling away from the faith. So, there are people that read this scripture, and if we go over to the uh, Amplified, it says, verse 3, Let no, uh, no one deceive you or beguile you in any way, for that day will not come except the apostasy comes first, unless the predicted great falling away of those who profess to be Christians has come, and the man of lawlessness, or sin, is revealed, who is the son of doom of perdition. So right there in the Amplified, it basically says that this verse of Scripture is referring to this apostasy, this falling away from the faith. Yet, that's not really what the Scripture is saying in this verse of Scripture. Now, if we go over to, uh, to Timothy, uh, let's go over to 1 Timothy, I believe it is, yeah, 1 Timothy 4.1. Here it says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead uh, at his, his appearing. Actually, wait a bit. First, is that right? First Timothy. I'm in first. Oh, I'm in second Timothy. I thought that wasn't right. I didn't read right. <laughs> Amazing how that little number can make a difference. First and second. <laughs> All right, let's go back to first Timothy chapter 4 where I meant to be. Here we go. That's, this is right. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, the last days, some shall depart from the faith. Now this word depart here is a word that has a root word of apostasia. But it says depart from the faith. Now if we go back over here to Second uh, Thessalonians 2, Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there first come a falling away. But it doesn't say of the faith. It just says falling away. Well, that's that Greek word apostasia. So what we've got to find out is what that word really means. It actually is translated depart. Now, where we read over in uh, 1 Timothy 4, it said depart. So that's the word apostasia from the faith, okay? So this word, apostasia, used here is very interesting because this word has a definite article in front of it. Now this is getting really technical, but bear with me. So what he's saying here in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a departure first. Now the word, the definite article in front of the word apostasia is like saying the with a capital T, the departure with a capital D. In other words, it adds emphasis. The departure has to come first. Well, remember, we're not saying there won't be a departure from the faith. There won't be an apostasia, there or apostasy, there will be. That's covered over in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, right? It says very plainly, they will apostasia from the faith. They will depart from the faith. But here it says there will be the departure, which has to come first. Well, I believe from the Scripture that this is talking about the rapture. Now the thing is, the word rapture is not used in the Bible. It's not a Bible word when we say rapture. It comes from a Latin word, rapture, which means to depart, <laughs> interestingly enough. So really, when you get right down to a reference to the rapture, the references to rapturing or departing are all over the Bible. Enoch, you know, walked with God and was not, for God took him. He departed, okay? That was a form of rapture or departing. Uh, believe it or not, in, with Noah, when God closed Noah in the ark, 
and he was lifted above the ocean waters. Think about this. What was the judgment that God sent? It was the flood. What was the flood? Waters. Okay, so Noah was lifted above the waters in the ark. So that is a type, a biblical type, of what God is doing during the rapture. He lifts us out above the tribulation that takes place. It's very biblical to think of a rapture as a departing to escape judgment. See, we won't face judgment on the earth because we're born again. We receive Jesus Christ as our Lord. Uh, he has borne our sins as well as our sicknesses and diseases. And so there's no reason for us to be judged with the rest of the world. So he takes us out, just like with Noah, we are lifted above the judgment so that we don't face that judgment. Now there will be a judgment seat of Christ where we'll receive judgment for what we've done in our life and, and we'll receive re rewards based on that. So Christians facing judgment of the sense of the judgment seat of Christ, that's absolutely scriptural. But it is not scriptural to think that Christians will receive the judgments of God during the tribulation. That would not make sense biblically. And it doesn't if we read the scriptures here. Because if we see this as the departure and read it that way, now let's see how it falls together. Let no man deceive you by any means, for the day of Christ which was the judgment day, in, at the last day, is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come the departure first. And then that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, which is the Antichrist. In other words, the Antichrist won't even be revealed globally until after the rapture. Now, we'll, we'll see operations of the Antichrist, Matter of fact, the, the scripture says the spirit of Antichrist is already at work right now. You know, it has been since, <laughs> since the book of Acts. The spirit of Antichrist has been at work. But the Antichrist himself, that individual person, won't even be revealed globally until after the departure. So that's pretty neat. And we know that he's revealed when he uh, commits the abomination of desolation at the middle of the tribulation at the temple in Jerusalem. He sets himself up and says, I am God, and there are supposed to be sacrifices made to him personally, and that is the abomination of desolation. It is an abomination because it, it takes the, the uh, Jewish temple, which has been sanctified, and completely destroys it from a spiritual point of view. It is made desolate. Okay, So that act is really what I think he will be revealed globally. Now, I could just imagine, just like we used to, <laughs> we used to see on the, uh, uh, some of the TV things where they did the Left Behind series and they had the movies and all that kind of stuff, and uh, uh, all of the things that happened, they were showing it on global TV and all this kind of stuff with the two witnesses in Jerusalem and all this kind of thing. Well, I would not be surprised since the Antichrist will be a world leader who is saying, there will be peace in the world, and he's going to bring peace to the world, that all the CNN cameras are going to be watching him, and that he's going to commit this abomination of desolation, and the whole world will see it. So that, to me, is when he's revealed. That's three years after we're gone. So that this scripture bears witness with what we have been taught about last day's teaching, in that the rapture will come first, because I believe it is a pre-tribulation rapture, uh, and then all of these events will happen. So let's keep going. Uh, who opposed it? Well, let's back up a second. Uh, latter part of verse 3. Uh, there shall come this departure first, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Again, that's the abomination of desolation. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? In other words, this shouldn't be news to you. I've told you about it. Uh, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Now, what is he that withholdeth? If we go over to the Amplified here in verse 6, it says, And now you know what is restraining him from being revealed at this time, so that he may be manifested or revealed 
in his appointed time. So there's something holding him back. Now, there have been a lot of different opinions <laughs> about what this was that was holding him back. There are those that teach that it's the Holy Spirit in the church, and when the church is taken out or raptured, then the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth, and that has been restraining the Antichrist, and then the Antichrist will be revealed when that occurs. Well, that sounds good, but the problem with that is, if the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth, how do people get born again during the uh, tribulation? Because there will be people born again during the tribulation, and they will be martyred. Okay? So how do they get born again if the Holy Ghost is gone? If it's the Holy Ghost that draws people to the Lord? So it can't be the Holy Ghost specifically. However, I think that this is a rare case where the he is referring to is the church of God, Christians. Because most of the time Christians are retur referred to as the bride of Christ, which would be a feminine word, which should say, she be taken out of the way, or she prevents the Antichrist from being revealed. But it doesn't. It says he. The thing is, I think this, this is just my opinion. Nobody's going to get terribly upset one way or the other on this one. But I believe that the, the, the church is referred to as the salt of the earth. Salt's a preservative. So us as Christians being here on the earth are preserving the earth, keeping the uh, message of the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist from openly operating, as openly as it will be during the tribulation. Uh, and that when we, the church, are removed, yeah, that still falls in line with that, talking about the, the Holy Spirit being taken out of the way. But the Holy Spirit's not leaving, it's the church that's leaving. Now, obviously, the Holy Spirit is within each believer, and you're not going to lose the Holy Spirit when we are raptured. So, yes, that can happen, but I don't believe the Holy Spirit himself leaves the earth. I believe he stays here in order for people to be born again and for him to draw people to the Lord. Just my opinion. Now, let's keep going here. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Like we said, the Spirit of Antichrist is already in operation. Only he who now letteth will let, that's King James, that means he who prevents him will continue to prevent him until he is taken out of the way. The he that is taken out of the way here, as I say, I believe refers to the church being taken out of the way. Now, believe it or not, there's some people that teach that it's the Roman Empire that is he that's preventing the Antichrist from operating. I don't know how they get that at all. Because the revived Roman Empire is supposed to be the vehicle by which the Antichrist operates. You know, he's in charge or the head of the, Roman, the revived Roman Empire. So how the Roman Empire is preventing the Antichrist from manifesting himself, I don't know. That don't make any sense to me. But if you read the, uh, the Amplified here, uh, in the footnote, it says, uh, many people believe this one who uh, restrains the Antichrist is the Holy Spirit, which we talked about, who lives in all believers and will be removed with them at Christ's coming. Yet a majority, this fascinated me, a majority think it refers to the Roman Empire. I just don't get that at all. I don't see how a majority can think that's true. Again, say what you will, I like my explanation, <laughs> that the church is taken out, and when the church is taken out, that is what is restraining the Antichrist because we're here to intercede. We're here to pray. We're here to, uh, as a matter of fact, i give you a good example. Uh, Terry Pearsons, who is, you know, uh, George Pearsons is pastor of Eagle uh, Mountain International Church there in, in uh, uh, Fort Worth area. Uh, Terry came on the uh, video on uh, Believer's Voice of Victory Network and said, I want everybody to pray for the Australian election. This is before the election was taking place. Uh, there is all the polls and all the pundits are saying that the liberals are going to win and the conservatives are not going to win and it's going to make Australia go even further off the deep end toward liberalism. We need to pray. And so she got all these people that are watching Believer's Voice of Victory Network praying and then the next day they had the election and they had all these newspapers. Miracle happens in Australia. How can this be? The conservative one. 
Well, that sounds very familiar with what happened in our elections not that long ago. And so the Lord is working through Christians who are standing for the Word of God and are uh, uh, praying in the Holy Ghost and are operating in the areas they know to operate in, and that's restraining the operation of the Antichrist, which is why he can't be revealed until the church is taken out of the way. So, you know, <laughs> I'm getting into a lot of things deeper than I thought. Of. I thought I was going to hit some high spots and go on, but we're, we're already here, so let's keep going. <laughs> uh, he that now prevents will prevent until he's taken out of the way. Verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, and all the power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. And they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So all of that is going to happen after we're gone. I'm personally glad it's going to happen after we're gone, and <laughs> not during that time. Now, let me read a couple of things that kind of drive this point home. This is really what I wanted to get into, talking about Bible study, getting into it deeply enough to really dig some things out. Uh, in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul expressed the desire that his thorn in the flesh might apostasia from him, depart from him. Uh, that is, that God would remove it. Of course, God said, my grace is uh, sufficient. You can handle this, but if you'll apply your own faith, this thorn in the flesh might depart is apostasia. Keep going. In Luke's gospel, the word is used of Anna the prophetess, who apostasia not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. In other words, she didn't depart from the temple. So again, this word apostasia is to depart. It's recorded in Acts 12.10 that when Peter was imprisoned by Herod, the angel conducted him through the prison gates to the streets of the city, and then the angel apostatiated from him, or departed from him. In Luke 4.13, following the temptation of Christ, it's recorded that the devil apostatiated from Jesus for a season. He departed from him for a season. So this word departure, or apostasia, is used all through the Scriptures and doesn't talk about departing from the faith, except in uh, over there in 1 Timothy 4, 1, where it talks about apostasia from pistis, which is the faith. So if we, if we look at it that way, it becomes clear. And I love the fact that it's got that definite article there, uh, the departure, a unique, special departure. And then let's, let's read, kind of in closing, uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1. Uh, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, or specifically, that in the latter times, the last days, some shall apostasia from the faith. So again, there's that phrase that people think of when they think of apostasy, the English word, to depart, but it's depart from the faith, very specifically. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That is the term, depart from the faith. Now, I say all that to say that if you, and I've, I've done this because I've heard preachers, they get up, they start teaching, and they quote Thessalonians about the departure, the apostasia, and they say this is the falling away from the faith. And it is true there'll be a falling away from the faith. What they're saying is partially true, but not based on that scripture. It has to be based over on 1 Timothy 4.1 not 2 Thessalonians. And a lot of people say, well, that's awfully specific, Brother Bill. Why are you getting so, uh, you know, uh, you might say religiously uh, strong on that one point? Well, the point is not just about the rapture of the church. The point is more about careful study of the Word. If we take a casual approach to studying the Word, we can quote a scripture like that and even be right that there will be a departure from the faith in the last days. But if we're using that scripture, we're not basing it on the scripture that actually is teaching departure from the faith. And in fact, you confuse people in the long run who then later on find out that it's talking about the departure, the rapture of the church. And they go, wait a minute, I thought that pastor said that, or a teacher said, or a minister said, 
that that was departure from the faith. That's why I like to be so specific about Scripture. Find the Scripture that supports the teaching that you're doing without just dra- grabbing one out of the air that everybody said, well, that's what it means, because it can lead to confusion. I know in my case, as, as a young kid teaching last day's teaching, I would read stuff like that, and I'd go, wait a minute, how does this mean that, and this mean that, and how does it all come together? It wasn't until I understood that no matter what men's opinions are, what really matters is a strict study of the Word of God, finding out what the Greek says, finding out what the Hebrew says, finding out what the actual meaning of that word. I mean, even talking about apostasia, if it weren't for that definite article making it the departure, it'd be easy to run right back past that scripture and not even think about the fact that that's probably one of the best scriptures in the Bible to support what the rapture is. Because like I said, the word rapture isn't even in the Bible. So where are you going to go to, to prove or to show what the rapture is talking about? That's the best scripture to do it. But if you gloss over it and miss the departure aspect of it, you miss that it's talking about the rapture in that verse of Scripture. So these are all things that I thought were fascinating in my study of some of these things. And to me it illustrated that we need to be very meticulous in our study of the Word of God and really dig down. I like what Jerry Savelle said one time. He said, as a teacher, I'm supposed to give you nuggets of truth. It's up to you to dig deep for the vein of gold. And I've always thought about that as a a teacher. That's my responsibility. It's not my responsibility to teach everything in the Bible all at once. We'd be here for hours and hours and hours. But if I can give you a nugget, and then you go study it out, and you find Scripture that support this and support that, and you start digging deeper and deeper into it, that's when spiritual growth really begins to happen. So praise the Lord. I just wanted to share all that with you tonight. And, uh, you know, it is an interesting study. Last day's teaching is difficult for a lot of people because there are so many opinions and people always want to latch on to one teacher or another to say this is the way it is, when really this, the Bible, is the way it is. It doesn't matter what a lot of people say. Let's find out what the Bible says, and that's where I'm comfortable. Praise the Lord. So we'll stop right there, and uh, those of you that are watching over the Internet, We'll just say that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith.